This morning, we have Kathleen Foley-Lewis. She is with us from Special Projects Director for the San Juan Pres Preservation Trust. She's gonna talk to us about Gary Oaks. Um, Kathleen has a BS in Wildlife Science from the University of Washington and a BA in Business Marketing from Washington State University. She is a resident of San Juan Island. And we're really thankful she came last night and had dinner with us because the inner island was canceled this morning. So, so thank you for being here. Um, Kathleen has been a Preservation Trust staff member since 2005. As Special Projects Director, Kathleen straddles the Preservation Trust stewardship, conservation, and outreach programs. She manages SYPT's species-specific projects, including the San Juan Islands Western Blue Bluebird and Island Marvel Butterfly Habit expansion projects. She is a Washington native with a long history of exploring the San Juan Islands by boat, kayak, and foot, and enjoys a wide variety of outdoor pursuits. So we're really excited to have her with us this morning. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, so thanks to the Garden Club for inviting me. I have to say this is the most professional AV setup I think I've ever seen. Um, so um, thanks to Laura and um, to Perry for um, uh, inviting me and, and making me feel welcome. And yes, when you're traveling by Inner Island Ferry, you have to plan ahead these days. So glad I came over last night. Um, so, yeah, just a few words about me and the San Juan Preservation Trust before I uh, get started into the meat of the presentation. Um, so, uh, I just celebrated my, my 19th year with the San Juan Preservation Trust. Um, I've been living on San Juan Island um, for, for 20 years. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the San Juan Preservation Trust, uh, we are a nonprofit land trust that works with private landowners to help them conserve their properties. And um, we've accomplished a lot in our uh, 40 plus years that we've been around. Um, we do a lot of public private partnerships. Probably one of the best well known ones that we've done is right here on Orcas Island. And that was um, the conservation of Turtleback Mountain, where we partnered with the San Juan County Land Bank um, to preserve all 1,576 acres of that beautiful property. Um, so I did leave some um, uh, information on the front table out there. There's uh, our latest year-end report, um, a few stickers for those of you who like swag, um, and really encourage you to visit our website and learn a little bit more about our organization if you are not already uh, familiar with us. So I am so excited to be talking about two of my most favorite organisms on the planet, Gary Oaks and Western Bluebirds. And I'm curious if there's anybody here in the room that is lucky enough to have Gary Oaks on your property. Couple of you. I plan to explore that that counts. That counts. That counts. That's great. Okay, so a few of you. That's awesome. All right. How about is anyone even luckier to have ever spotted a Western bluebird? Okay. Where where have you seen one? Victoria. In Victoria, great. How about you? Buck Buck Mountain. Now let's talk about bluebirds. Difference between a bluebird or a bluebird. So you have Stellar's jays here. Stellar's jays are blue. Well, they're kind of bluish black, right? But they're not a bluebird. Okay. Probably what you saw was a. So. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll dive into that in more detail later. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. And and this uh, talk is going to be kind of broken into two sections. First, talking about Gary Oaks and Gary Oak Habitat, and then we'll launch into uh, Western Bluebirds. And the whole idea is really to tie these two species together, and you can see where the intersect is. 
Okay. Okay. So um, a little bit about Gary Oaks. Um, this may be repeat information for some folks if you're familiar with this tree, but for those of you who aren't as familiar, it's always good to, to start with some of the basics. Um, uh, Gary Oaks are also known as Oregon white oak. There are only uh, native oak species here in the islands. Um, scientific name is Quercus gariana. Uh, the gariana comes from Nicholas Berry, who was a um, uh, uh, um, trader with the Hudson's Bay Company. And I believe this is the only species he's ever had named after him. What a lucky guy to have this big, beautiful, amazing tree named for him. Um, these trees are wind pollinated, okay? And so male and female flowers um, occur on the same tree and uh, they're pollinated by wind. Um, the developing acorns, that were, the fruits of the Gary Oak, of course, that we're so familiar with, um, really don't start establishing these trees until they're about 20 years old. And um, those acorns are distributed by gravity. They fall to the ground and sprout up where they fall, or they get carried around by animals. Here on Orcas Island, stellar jays move them around. Um, uh, flying squirrels, Douglas squirrels, and um, of course humans move these acorns around. Um, the indigenous peoples, um, uh, harvested them as a food source and um, would intentionally um, plant them places. Um, we as local, um, uh, or local, the the uh, more newer residents of these islands um, would also uh, move these acorns around. Um, who was in any oak areas this past year and saw the incredible mass year we had where there were so many acorns produced? Um, over on San Juan Island, there were carpets of acorns and, and folks were gathering them up and planting them all over the islands. Um, so they do get, the acorns get moved around. The trees will also sprout by root sprout. So if you have an oak tree growing and there's uh, roots that are growing uh, close to the soil surface, it'll sprout from those roots as well. And that's actually um, pretty good for those little um, saplings coming up because they've got that established root structure already that they can they can uh, draw from. These are really long-lived trees, uh, you know, four to five hundred years old in some cases, and um, they um, kind of known as being you know very slow to grow and also very slow to die. So you think about maybe the first third of their life they're growing. That middle third is when they're sort of in their peak sort of um, uh, stage, and then that last third is when they're slowly senescing and dying off. Very fire resistant trees, especially when mature. That nice thick uh, bark on the oaks makes them uh, very fire resistant. Okay, so let's talk about the historical and current um, habitat of these trees. Um, the real takeaway here is that the current um, extent of, um, of uh, presence of these trees and uh, oak woodlands has vastly shrunken from what it was historically. So prior to European settlement in the greater, you know, Willamette Valley, Puget Trough, Georgia Basin, um, over 2 million acres of habitat was considered oak woodland or oak prairie, oak savanna. Okay. And you can see it's very contiguous that that outer boundary that's um, sort of in the dotted line, that was the original sort of extent of the habitat. And you can see how it spreads all the way up um, into uh, southeastern Vancouver Island. Currently, we're looking in this entire eco region, we're looking at about 40,000 acres. So a, a massive um, decline. Um, and the existing habitat that there is now is very you know, disjunct from each other. It's not continuous. And really our best um, uh, uh, example of, of these oak woodland and oak prairie habitats that remains is down at the joint base lewis McCord prairie between Tacoma and Olympia. Um, and the primary reason that's there is because it's a military installation and hasn't succumbed to um, the development uh, that we've seen elsewhere. So very little remains, 3% of the historical um, in, in our state, 3% um, of what was here historically remains. In the San Juan Islands, it's even bleaker. Um, this map shows 
uh, grasslands, um, historic grasslands and historic oak. And I will say about this map is it's probably not very accurate. Um, there's a lot of work going on the ground right now to, um, to uh, update the mapping um, of uh, not only the historic areas, but also what wood do we have currently. And um, part of the reason is it's not very accurate, especially for some of the oak areas, is that um, some of these oaks may still be out there, but they they're, um, have been overtopped by um, Douglas fir. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of hiding down in this canopy. So just looking at aerial maps, you know, you can't really see it. And so, and a lot of oak woodlands um, uh, are um, on private lands that maybe uh, folks haven't had access to, to be able to accurately map. So there's current work going on right now to sort of update this map. The point being still, this is an extremely rare ecosystem here uh, in, in the San Juan Islands. So where do they usually grow? Um, in our island, so oaks in general can grow in, in a fairly broad uh, variety of habitats throughout the whole ecoregion between Oregon and all the way up into um, Vancouver Island. But here in our islands, we typically see them growing in two different kinds of areas. One is um, what we consider kind of an upland prairie where you have maybe a little bit more uh, deeper soils. Um, and um, historically they would have grown in this beautiful mosaic of trees and shrubs and abundant wildflowers like you see there. Um, uh, that photo um, on the top is um, actually from Vancouver Island. Um, we don't have upland prairie that looks like this anywhere in the islands. <laughs> Um, the best example of what that historic prairie would be would have been um, uh, uh, San Juan Valley um, on San Juan Island. And um, while there are still oak trees out there, the understory has completely been altered by um, uh, primarily grazing um, and agricultural practices. What we see a lot of more typically in our islands are oaks persisting in what we call rocky bulbs. So these rock outcroppings where the shallow, there's really thin, shallow soils. And the main reason the oaks are there is because other trees can't survive there. You know, these trees um, are able to put a taproot down, it really, you know, worm its way down to find um, some moisture. Um, um, and then they're also, um, you know, once they get established, they're, they're very strong. Of course, the wood is very dense. They're able to withstand, you know, winds, um, where smaller um, uh, seedlings of other types of trees, um, particularly conifers like Douglas fir, may get blown away or can't um, get established in those thinner, rocky soils. And so, um, so where you'll typically see, you know, oaks in these kinds of habitat, they're, they're often clinging to shorelines, you know, um, or they're, um, in the case of like Turtleback Mountain, they're up on like south facing balds. Again, these kind of warmer drying climates that these oaks are a little bit better adapted to than, than other species. And it's important to remember that the reason we even still have oak habitat at all is because it is a product of very intentional, intentional burning by indigenous peoples who lived here before they were forcibly removed from the islands. These you know, oaks got established after uh, the last ice age. And when indigenous peoples moved out to these islands, they used these um, trees. Um, I mean, they were a food source, right? They could, they could use the acorns. Um, but the surrounding habitat was really critical for production of camas, which was uh, another uh, staple food item. Um, and then, um, and so to be able to maintain sort of the structure and this open habitat and um, to um, stimulate production of camas and, and berry producing shrubs and everything like that, they would um, intentionally burn these landscapes very low intensity ground fires. And what that did was just keep the competing shrubs um, and other kind of undesirable things away. It opened up these grasslands and woodlands, allowed them to hunt deer uh, more easily. And like I said, you know, really produced um, uh, their, their staple foods. 
So after Europeans arrived in the islands, of course, and, and um, indigenous folks were, um, were uh, uh, chased out, um, we came with a big fear of wildfires, of course. Um, the fires stopped, you know, conifers, shrubs started moving in, um, oaks would drop their acorns, but they wouldn't be able to, you know, hit the ground because they were dropping down into shrubs. Um, so they weren't able to keep, you know, establishing themselves. And so we saw a real alteration of the whole landscape um, during that time. All right. So what's the big deal about these trees? Why, why do we care so much that they're, they're rare? Um, why do we, why are so many different uh, organizations working on not only protecting what's left, but restoring it? Well, oaks are considered a keystone species. And if you've heard that term, you'll know that that means this is an organism that has an outsized presence on the landscape relative to its abundance, okay? It is home to about 120 different species of um, plants and animals and over 800 different types of insects. Some are obligates. So an obligate species means it spends its entire life on this one tree. So an example of that is this little critter down here. This is called the Papertius dusky wing. This is a butterfly that has, that is solely dependent on uh, Gary Oak um, to live out its life history, okay? Of course, um, in addition to um, uh, uh, the dusky wing, um, there's a lot of other species that, that use these trees. They may not be obligates, but they do use them. Um, hollows, of course, in the trees um, provide a really, really important um, habitat element. Western bluebirds, which we'll be talking about, here's one right here, um, use these um, cavities for nesting. Um, this picture was taken on San Juan Island a couple of years ago when we had uh, Western bluebirds a nest in a Gary Oak tree, um, which was a very exciting development for our project. Um, other species that use it, I can barely see this guy, this is a hoary bat. Um, that's actually, I don't think, on an oak tree right there, but that is a, um, a hoary bat. It can sh shows how they can um, uh, use, here's the oak bark here, um, shows how they use it for camouflage and also to kind of hide in those furrows. Um, of course, there's um, the, the acorns provide the food source, um, lots of microhabitats for mosses and lichens, um, and um, uh, just the shade and the structure of an open grown mature oak um, provides a lot of microhabitat down below where the leaf litter is um, for um, for lots of um, insects as well as reptiles and amphibians. So it, it really is um, this tree that's like, you know, think of it as a, a condominium, you know, it's, it's providing homes for so many different things. And because this is a garden club, of course, I thought you might be very interested in looking at pictures of pretty flowers. <laughs> and so I have to include um, some of the wildflowers are commonly associated with these oak habitat. And one of the things that I really want to draw attention to is the oft overlooked wonder of grasses. Okay. In a true oak prairie setting, you have bunch grasses. Okay. Um, so bunch grasses are things like um, fescues and bromes. Okay. Um, that grow in, this is uh, Romer's fescue here, that grow in, you know, these little tight clusters. And you can see there's lots of little um, kind of bare ground around these bunch, bunch grasses. This is historically what our, all of our grasslands look like here in the islands, these kinds of grasses. With the arrival of European settlement um, and grazing animals, of course, the grass layer changed greatly. We brought in quackgrass and crabgrass and Kentucky bluegrass, all these mat forming grasses. We brought in tall grasses uh, that, you know, form very dense thickets like um, uh, tall fescue and um, orchard grasses, okay? But historically, this is what you would have seen. And what this allows is other prairie wildflowers 
to kind of grow in all these open spaces. So here it is with some harsh paintbrush. Um, and I'll just kind of go um, left to right here. So uh, beautiful camas lily, or sorry, it's not in the lily family anymore. Beautiful camas uh, here. We have two species, the great camas and the common camas. Um, golden paintbrush which used to be on the endangered species list in Washington state. It was recent, recently delisted, much to the chagrin of those of us who live out here in the San Juan Islands, where it is largely extirpated. The reason it was delisted is because it's made a, a great recovery uh, in other areas like South Puget Sound. Um, the, there's only a few extant or naturally occurring uh, populations of golden paintbrush left. One of them is in Lower San Juan Valley that the San Juan Preservation Trust is overseeing and managing. There are other areas where people have planted it out in a wild setting, um, but it's it's greatly reduced from um, what what the extent was historically. Uh, Oregon sunshine. Uh, this is field chickweed. This is called sea blush. Uh, Menzies larkspur. Um, Blue-eyed Mary, bicolored lupin, bear semelmatium, and western buttercup. Beautiful, gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. Amazing. And when you see, often these are all growing together. No gardener, sorry, no gardener could plant something that beautiful. Um, this is, this is, it's really stunning. A true Gary Oak wildflower meadow is unlike anything. I've ever seen before. Um, just the mix of colors um, and buzzing of pollinators. And, um, and so these are all species you can see here on Orcas Island. And if you go hike up on Turtleback Mountain where the land bank and the preservation trust have been working very hard to restore oak habitat up there in the springtime, you'll see these species growing. Okay, so I mentioned the threat of these systems, and I just want to make sure um, uh, we, you know, just really talk about this real briefly. Um, of course, uh, um, major factors in these systems is the invasion of uh, uh, non-native plants like Scotch broom, um, huge problem. Um, and then, but also it's important to remember that along with um, European settlement comes um, animals that were introduced to um, the United States, like the European starling. And this is having an impact on things like bluebirds um, and other cavity nesting birds because they're, they're aggressive uh, competitors for these secondary nest, nest cavities, and they'll, they'll just chase the bluebirds away. Um, as I mentioned already, habitat destruction and fragmentation, a huge issue. Herbivory, huge issue. Um, we have, you know, grazing animals that will nip off little um, uh, prairie wildflowers or um, emerging oak saplings unless they're protected. Um, we also have deer, <laughs> which are a massive, massive factor. And um, that is why most people that are working in restoration settings right now are fencing everything <laughs> to keep the deer away. It's a, a sad but true reality. Um, the other issue um, that I touched on briefly before is overtopping by Douglas fir. Douglas fir grow really quickly and oaks grow slowly. And so though we love our, our Douglas fir, we are the evergreen state after all, um, uh, they do um, have an impact on, um, on oak habitat in that they will quickly outcompete them. And as soon as those oaks get shaded out, that crown starts to die back and they won't um, produce the acorns um, like they used to. So just a few pictures of some of the restoration efforts uh, underway, um, a little bit of burning just to open up um, so, and uh, get rid of some of the competing shrub layer uh, and um, allow for um, planting of native plants. Um, this is some work up on Turtleback where they're plugging in native plants. Um, other ways to remove Douglas fir around oak trees is uh, what's called girdling. So you can see this cut here in the um, in the uh, Douglas fir. That allows that fir to just kind of slowly die back to maybe turn into a nice snag. Um, and this is often done when firs are growing either right up through a gary oak or very close to a gary oak where if we felled the tree, it could damage the oak. 
So lots of conservation and, and restoration efforts going on by the trust and the land bank. But I do want to mention there's other, you know, other agencies in the county, you know, state parks, national parks, um, uh, anybody, uh, DNR, anybody that has, you know, this kind of uh, system in their holdings um, is working on restoration efforts. Okay, I'm going to pivot and talk about my next favorite, well, I'm not going to order them, my other favorite organism, um, and that is uh, the Western Bluebird. And um, so we talked a little bit about bluebirds versus birds that are blue. <laughs> um, and um, yes, we have birds that are blue here, um, like the stellar jay, um, which for those of you on Orcas, you may not know, we don't have stellar jays on San Juan Island. What what's up with that? Every now and then, maybe one or one or two will make their way over to San Juan, and there's a stellar jay sighting. It's all very exciting, but they're pretty much um, uh, here on San Juan Island. I mean, they're a bird; they can fly. It's a similar habitat, but um, so, anyways, we're going to talk about bluebirds, which are a distinct um, uh, species. So, in North America, we have three species. We have the mountain bluebird, which is really beautiful. Um, there's the male, there's the female. Um, we have eastern bluebirds, male and female, and then the western bluebird, which is male and female. Um, uh, eastern bluebirds, of course, occupy east side of the United States. Mountain bluebirds will tend to, uh, their range is sort of the mountain states, but they bleed over into western states as well. And then the western bluebirds are restricted primarily to the west coast. Okay, so we're going to talk about Western bluebirds because that's the species we have here. And that's the focus of um, a um, uh, very long uh, reintroduction effort that I've been involved in. Um, and so we're going to talk, I want to introduce the species to you first. Um, so uh, bluebirds are a member of the thrush family, of course, which includes robins and, and other types of thrushes. As I mentioned, they're sexually dimorphic, male and female have different, different plumages. Um, and they are pretty prolific breeders, will often have two broods a year, sometimes three. They're considered a short distance migrant. So um, they start arriving in the islands um, uh, or to San Juan Island uh, primarily um, as early, well, as right now, in fact, just before the meeting, I checked my text and I just got a message from a landowner on San Juan Island that photographed three of them on their property. And I found four last week. So um, they're starting to come back right now, especially since we are, we're kind of warming up sort of fast. Um, we don't know exactly where they go in the wintertime from the islands. We think they may go um, uh, all the way to the Willamette Valley, but it's possible they don't go that far. And I do suspect that some actually may overwinter here. Um, I don't expect you to read all this, but just to show you that these are um, bird, these birds are kind of a generalist species, meaning that they can uh, use a variety of different habitat. Good for them, because in the wake of climate change, you know, animals that are going to be able to adapt to a lot of different kinds of climate are going to be the ones that are going to persist, right? So in general, during their breeding season, which is, you know, June, July, August, um, well, May, June, July, August, um, they use a bunch of different habitats. So um, this is kind of like an evergreen uh, needle leaf, so like a pine forest. So that would be more typically what they use on the east slope of the Cascades. Um, but here in the islands, we see them using grasslands, um, uh, wo woody savannas, wherever we have it. So, um, you know, uh, um, oak trees that are, you know, spread out, not in any dense woodland, but sort of spread out with a large grassland component. Um, and then um, uh, up here, uh, oh, croplands, of course, being a big one as well. Um, and, um, and then uh, agricultural areas as well. So um, grasslands and agricultural areas. So they, they use a, a, a wide variety, but historically they have a preference for, for oak habitat. In fact, if you look at a range map for Western bluebirds historically, and you look at a range map for that uh, oak habitat, it, it directly overlaps with each other, okay? So 
These birds historically would have been using oak habitat, probably pretty exclusively, but have learned to adapt to other types of situations um, as um, this habitat has gotten altered. Well, why, why do they like the oaks? Well, a lot has to do with the bluebird's life history characteristics. So these are birds that um, like to perch on low branches and feed on the ground. So they'll be perched on a low branch and they'll see an insect crawling on the ground and they'll come down to the ground, pick it up. They don't stay on the ground long because that's dangerous for them. So they grab it and they go right back up to a, um, a low perch to consume the insect. Well, oaks, just because of the way they grow, provide that great structure, right? They have that those big open grown um, spreading branches that you know often are growing fairly low to the ground that allows them to see those insects. Historically, those grasses would have been those bunch grasses. Remember the kind of sparse, you know, open dirt around them? That makes it easy for those bluebirds to see um, the insects on the ground. And of course, then the cavity feature um, as the oaks different parts of the oak branches and stuff start to die off um, and, um, and cell walls break down, fungi move in, that eventually brings in insects, which eventually brings in woodpeckers to excavate the cavities, which then the bluebirds and other cavity nesting species use. Okay. So the good thing about Western bluebirds, of course, is that they readily adapt to artificial nest cavities. So it's really hard to grow old dead trees in a, in a hurry, right? But you can create uh, artificial cavities for them as um, a, a really critical component of their life cycle. So they do adapt very well. I'm sure many, most people are familiar with the fact that there's bluebirds, bluebird trails all over the US where people have put up nest boxes to support them. Um, during uh, the breeding season, they're primarily insectivorous, so they'll uh, eat lots of uh, uh, creepy crawly things on the ground. Um, they will hawk insects from the air too. If you're familiar with flycatcher species, they'll hawk from the air off coming off a branch. And then in the winter time, they switch their diet because insects aren't as much are readily available, and they'll move over to berries. Um, and um, here in the islands, um, if they are uh, staying late in the season, I've seen them on madrona berries. Um, uh, and if uh, we have, there's not a lot of juniper uh, left in the islands, but where there is and where it's um, producing fruit, um, they will eat that. I've even witnessed them um, uh, in a couple occasions um, foraging in the intertidal zone eating little arthropods. Mm -hmm. So that might be a really unique little adaptation just for the birds that occupy um, these islands. <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, somebody, I don't know if you heard that, somebody asked if they eat hawthorn berries. I don't know, I've never seen it, but um, wouldn't that be great if they did? <laughs> okay, so um, let's talk about what happened to them. So, Back in, uh, again, pre-European settlement, um, you would have found these birds um, all the way up the Willamette Valley. Again, here's that oak ecoregion kind of overlaid with their, their range map. Um, so all the way up um, uh, into uh, British Columbia and southeastern Vancouver Island. And um, the, the populations, especially at the very northern extent of their range, you know, anytime you spread a range map of any species out, right, you know, the, the far extremes, they kind of get, uh, there's less and less of them, whereas, you know, the bulk of the population is going to be sort of in the center of that range. So they were probably never here in really large numbers, but they were here. And um, by the mid-1900s, they were pretty well extirpated from all of this area. Uh, they were still down in the Willamette Valley, and there was one breeding pair left in Olympia. But what happened to them? Well, um, just like all the other uh, things that happened with oaks, loss of um, habitat primarily. Um, as these um, habitats started getting altered um, for development, you know, either for you know housing or for agricultural use or whatever. Um, uh, they um, started losing their oak trees 
and which meant they were losing their, their cavity sites for, for breeding. Um, the introduction of exotic species made it challenging for them to continue breeding because they had just a lot more competition for cavities. So bluebirds had been, western bluebirds had been extirpated from the San Juan Islands and this whole kind of North Puget Sound and Georgia Basin region um, since the 1960s. The last sightings were, were around then. And um, so in 2007, um, uh, a plan was hatched and um, the San Juan Preservation Trust joined forces with the American Bird Conservancy um, and another organization, the um, Eco Studies Institute. And we um, talked through a plan to reintroduce Western bluebirds back to the San Juan Islands. And really the goal was to reestablish a viable breeding population here um, with a secondary goal of having um, this bluebird sort of serve as a very emblematic a member of a disappearing ecosystem. So it was it was kind of a twofold um, uh, plan to do this. And so what the initial project design was to um, bring 90 breeding adults up from the population at Joint Base Lewis McCord. So remember how I said there was one breeding pair there? Well, that population due to a reintroduction effort down there had grown to a very robust um, uh, population of bluebirds. And we got permission from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife to capture birds from Joint Base Lewis McCord and bring them here to reintroduce. The plan was to bring up 90 birds, um, pause for a couple of years, see how they do. And then if necessary, do a second round of reintroductions, which is what we what wound up happening. We brought up 60 more in a second five-year phase. And we're, um, and then we uh, basically um, paused for another four, four years, um, monitored the population. Um, we did do one more additional family group last year um, just to kind of augment the population. In 2012, um, the, popula the folks on Vancouver Island um, decided to um, uh, uh, mirror what we've been doing here in the San Juan Islands um, for Vancouver Island so that we could really create that entire range of that historical um, uh, flightway and, and breeding range. And so they have been um, also doing reintroductions since 2012. Um, and uh, the population there is a little smaller than ours, but, um, but they're, they're still persisting. So real quick, a little bit about uh, how you capture bluebirds. <laughs> uh, this is down on the uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord site. You can see there's a nest box here, and uh, we basically put up these mist nets. Um, uh, you know, in the afternoon, lower them down, uh, wait for the birds, uh, a pair to go in there um, at uh, nightfall. Um, put the net mist nets back up, and then when they first arrive out in the morning. Um, to go feed, they fly right into the net and then we're able to catch them. The birds uh, are then uh, banded um, with identifying leg bands and then um, put into a cage and uh, covered up for, um, for stress uh, reduction. And then they get a ride on the Washington State Ferry, <laughs> just like all the, everybody else. We did have early on in the project, we did have, did have some pilots that offered to fly birds up, which was seemed like a more appropriate way for them to get here. So we did uh, have some pilot help as well. And then once the birds got here, they are put into a um, temporary mobile aviary. And so this is something we just deploy, look at it there in all that beautiful oak habitat. Um, and you know we set it up with um, perches inside and there's a, a feeding uh, station where we can come in, they don't see us. We're able to put food in there for them, keeps their stress settled down. Um, they're in there for several weeks, get them acclimated. Um, if it's a newly mated pair, we're gonna look for signs that they're, they're wanting to be frisky with each other. And then we decide it's time to release them. And then we wait for a bluebird day like this and we open up the top and off they go. 
And uh, we have uh, uh, installed nest boxes nearby. And the hope is that they will hone in on that nest box and get, get busy making baby bluebirds. And it works. That technique has worked. Um, we've had a lot of, lot of success over the years with um, the birds that we've released staying here and breeding. Um, here's some baby bluebirds newly hatched. These guys are probably just a couple days old. Um, this is when um, they're uh, getting closer for uh, getting ready to be banded. Um, we fit them with these little leg bands. And um, uh, when they're at about you know this stage between um, 11 and 12 days old, and then, um, and here's just a nest box here. Uh, here we are just kind of going through the process. You can see they're just kind of little squidgy, easy to manage things at this stage. They don't have their flight feathers yet. And that's the scale. Uh, yeah, the scale, we uh, uh, took weights on them. So yeah, we get some basic biometrics on them. Um, and then they get their little colored leg bands and these are fitted onto their legs and this will help identify them into the future. So when I see Western bluebirds with leg bands on them now, I, uh, once I can get that color band combination, I can go back to my records and I know exactly when that bird was born, what nest it came out of, and, and so it really helps us track survivability. So how are they doing? Well, it's been up and down. Um, you know, nobody said reintroductions like this are for the faint of heart. <laughs> um, it is a long road to recovery. And so uh, we are now entering our 18th field season on this project. Um, so what you can see happening here is during the, you know, of course, in the early days, um, these, the open circles are translocated um, adults. So these are birds that were brought here. Okay. So this helps uh, show, um, uh, you know, how the population has grown based on the translocations. This is the overall number here, okay? Well, you can see in 2018, when we seized the second round of reintroductions, um, that the population is kind of held steady. And then in 2022, um, it dropped. 2023 was about the same, 15 birds. So we, that's when we added that. Sorry, I don't have 2023 on the graph yet. Um, uh, but that's why we added another um, uh, family of birds here. Um, so um, so it's, it's a long road um, and, um, and uh, we continue to remain hopeful that you know, these birds are coming back every year. Um, they're, they're continuing to choose to breed here. And so, um, we're going to just keep sticking with it. There we go. Of course, um, it's really important to remember that this project would not have happened without the involvement of many private landowners on San Juan Island. If we had to restrict where we place nest boxes just to public lands, um, or lands owned by you know the land bank or the preservation trust, we would have we would have been in a lot of trouble because um, these birds are choosing to go to uh, areas where there's uh, you know a lot of private land, and so we have I've had so much great cooperation over the years, and I have landowners on San Juan now that are bluebird crazy, absolutely bluebird crazy, so excited when they show up every year. Um, I have one one guy that invented a. Um, he adapted a, a pond trout feeder, um, you know, a time like trout feeder to distribute mealworms for the bluebirds um, because he wanted to make sure they were getting mealworms when he was away on vacation. Um, uh, the same gentleman also created a sign when the bluebirds were hatching out of one of his nest boxes, which was somewhat close to his driveway. He made a sign that said, that he put at the entrance of his driveway that said, slow, stupid baby birds. And I it had no punctuation to it with it. And I said, so Brian, are you saying slow, stupid, comma, baby birds? Or are you saying slow, stupid baby birds? <laughs> In either case, people slowed down when they drove into his driveway. Um, the other thing I just realized about this collection of photos is this shows how long I've been involved with the project. This is my son. And he was in kindergarten 
He is now a senior at the University of Washington. <laughs> wow, time flies. All right, so um, I do want to make a word, uh, say a few words about um, uh, what I personally think is going to be the most limiting factor for bluebird success here. Because clearly, they're adaptable species. They're, they can adapt to a lot of different kinds of environments as long as they have those habitat elements, cavity nests, or you know, cavities for nesting, short, you know, mid-story per perches for foraging, and short grasses to feed in. They have those things, they can they, they can succeed. This is what's going to be the problem for them long run. And um, I hope you'll indulge me. I'm gonna get on my outdoor cat soapbox for a moment. Mm -hmm. Outdoor cats are the number one reason for songbird decline in the United States. Free roam cats. I love cats, I have one, I've, but I've always kept my cats indoors, okay, for this reason. I have lost several bluebirds, critical breeding females to cats, and it's heartbreaking. Um, please, if you have cats, I really encourage you to keep them indoors. Raccoons are another huge factor. Fortunately, we've been, we've kind of figured out how to outsmart raccoons. They're crafty, we all know that. Um, but you just have to be a little bit smarter than them. And what we've learned with the nest boxes is as long as we protect the nest boxes by putting them on like a freestanding post with a PVC, you know, sleeve or flashing or something like that, they can't crawl up, then the nest, the nestlings and the eggs inside those nest boxes are protected. Um, this little critter is probably the number one thing I'm concerned about. Well, these two, the cats and the uh, house sparrows together. Um, English house sparrows are a non-native cavity nesting bird. Um, you're probably familiar with this species, even if you don't know its name. Um, it's often found in, uh, you know, suburban and urban settings. A friend of mine likes to call it the Starbucks bird because it's always the one that's, you know, pecking around at your feet when you're sitting outside at a cafe somewhere. Um, they seem very harmless and small and tiny, but they can be brutal <laughs> and uh, lethal killers. This is a bluebird a dead nestling that was attacked by uh, a house sparrow. Um, <clears throat> and the reason they're doing that is they're, ju they're just um, uh, trying to get access to those nest cavities for breeding. So I am at the point now on San Juan Island that I will not put up nest boxes in any place that um, uh, house sparrows also occupy. Um, and if any house sparrows do take up residence, I will remove the nest spots. Um, and I have a number of uh, folks that are working on all, all different kinds of ways of, of outwitting house sparrows. And, and I've got a whole arsenal of tricks up my sleeve um, that we're using. But um, this is just, um, you know, a, a, a critical um, species that may be a very limiting factor for these birds. Um, these are all brought in by us. These are all animals that we're not going to fault them for being successful. They've learned to adapt to human climates. They're part of, you know, they're part of our ecosystem. And, um, and so um, we just have to learn to live with them. And these bluebirds are going to have to learn to adapt as well. So um, I just want to end with um, a note. I know that might be a little bit of a downer, so I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> And that is, um, personally, I am really, really encouraged by um, the, the amount of attention and effort that is going into um, uh, oak restoration that is happening here in the islands, as I mentioned, by multiple, multiple agencies and, and private landowners as well. Um, uh, we have, there's a couple up on Katy Mountain on Salmon Island that has just made this their life's work. And their oak woodland that they have up there is astonishing, um, just beautiful habitat. And so I, I'm daily, I'm encouraged by that because I see that we're acknowledging um, this, this outsized impact that humans have had on these environments and, and figuring out a way to um, restore this biodiversity. Because that's really what the, the goal is, right? It's restoring biodiversity. It isn't trying to get it back to some pre-settlement condition, but really let's just get this habitat back functioning um, in a way that all these different organisms can survive. The other thing that keeps me coming back to the bluebirds every year, even though their numbers are still perilously low, 
is that they show up every year. They come back every year. So they're telling us, you know, we want to be here. We like it here. Help us survive. And this may just be a species that is what we would consider a conservation dependent species, meaning it's just gonna need a helping hand for a while until it can get to the numbers um, that it can have a real self-sustaining viable population. So I remain hopeful um, and I hope all of you will as well. And I encourage you, if you are interested in this work, please support the work of the Salmon Preservation Trust um, and um, uh, the land bank, um, which the vote will be coming up again um, soon um, to re-up the land bank. Um, we do encourage you to, to vote to re-up them again. So um, I'm gonna stop there. And I think maybe we have a little bit of time for questions. Go ahead. When we introduced you to Gary, how far apart it should be space? Oh, that's a great question. That. Oh, sure, sure. She asked um, when you're planting out Gary Oaks, how far apart? Um, yeah, that uh, there's um, there's some challenges to that because um, uh, sometimes we plant them kind of close together because we just don't know how many of the seedlings will, will actually survive. Um, but you certainly want to account for the fact that when they're uh, mature, um, that they're going to need these big, um, you know, open grown uh, areas and that they aren't going to want to be competing with each other. So, you know, typically plantings I've, I've done and that I've seen, you know, there may be, you know, five to 10 feet away from each other. Yeah. Other questions? Go ahead. On your population graph, you wound up at 20, on your population graph, you wound up at 15 in mm -hmm. 2022. That's 15 birds or 15 pairs? 15 birds. Yeah. Yeah. So seven, seven breeding pair um, and one un, unpaired uh, adult. Um, they, that seven breeding pair, though, you know, produced about uh, 60 uh, nestlings. Um, the survival rate, of course, of those nestlings is about 20% to adulthood. So for every, you know, they typically will have a clutch of five birds, um, but only usually one of those five um, will make it to adulthood. Is this thing working? Oh, yeah. It is. It is. Oh, do you consider the influx of uh, barred owls to be a problem for the predation of the bluebirds too? No, no. Um, barred owls don't, don't eat bluebirds. Um, they're... They're eat almost um, exclusively will eat uh, mammals. So yeah, um, a native bird that does predate on bluebirds, of course, are kestrels, um, which we have some. Um, of course, things like peregrine falcons and Cooper's hawks um, will take them as well. So they have avian predators, but not barred owls. What about stellar jays? Stellar jays? Um, yeah, you know that's interesting. Jays. Um, you know, jays being in the Corvid family along with, you know, crows and, and ravens and magpies and things. Um, uh, I think if they could get access to those nest boxes um, would likely take nestlings or, or eggs. Um, but given that we don't have stellar jays on San Juan Island, um, it's not, a, I don't worry about it too much. Plus they're a much bigger bird. Um, and so it would be hard for them to um, get entry into the nest box. And this box protects Sorry? That's the, it, then that's why the bluebirds choose the nest box as opposed to an exposed nest. Um, well, they've always, yes. I mean, um, any cavity nesting species, and there's a number of cavity nesting birds that we have here that would use a secondary cavity. So tree swallows, violet green swallows, chickadees, um, house wrens, um, and bluebirds um, all can be found in these cavities. Um, obviously, that's a, a life history strategy to protect their nestlings as opposed to building an open cup nest. From our Zoom audience, was there something in particular that happened in 2014 and 2018 that caused the number of um, bluebirds to drop? And is there an explanation for that? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, and this was something that we saw not just in the San Juan Islands, but kind of range wide for bluebirds. Um, and it was largely due to some very cold, wet springs. 
And because bluebirds tend to arrive early, they usually are getting here about the same time as tree swallows, like in you know late February, early March. Um, they breed early. Um, and so when those young are developing in the nest, um, you know, it could be April and we get one of those Aprils that we've had or Mays where it's been very cold and wet. It's hard for um, uh, adults to find enough insects to feed them. And so, um, so they perish. So is it a good idea to supplement their diet with mealworms? Yeah, that's a great, another great question. So we made the decision after that first really pretty dramatic loss of nestlings um, to start supplemental feeding of mealworms um, uh, just during the breeding season when there were nestlings in a nest, um, just to kind of safeguard against that happening again. Um, and so um, uh, we will do that, especially if, if the weather starts to get very cold um, and, you know, unseasonably cold, then we um, do do supplemental feeding because um, that's something that we can control while we're still just trying to build the population. And if you just describe how you would do that, how would you get it close to the nest? Or um, yeah, well, we just, um, uh, we just put a little tray. We don't put it close to the nest because that can draw on predators. Um, so we'll site it somewhere far away. Those birds find it, you know, they're flying around, they see little wiggling mealworms, they, they, you know, hone in on it, so. Are you introducing bluebirds on orchids or just San Juan Island? Another great question, and one I've gotten many times over the years. Kathleen, when are you gonna bring bluebirds to Orcas Island? Well, there's, um, the, the short answer to that is no. And there, the reason for it is that, a um, couple reasons. Well, one, historically, all of the historical records really only report bluebirds from um, San Juan Island and Lopez. And um, it's always puzzled me a little bit because there's great habitat over here for them. I mean, I think about Crow Valley, that would be a really likely place for bluebirds to be. Um, uh, but uh, given um, the expense and um, of doing these kinds of reintroductions and the amount of just boots on the ground personnel, um, we wanted to um, uh, restrict the uh, reintroductions to one location. So we started with San Juan Island. Um, and then with subsequent uh, reintroductions, we just wanted to make sure these birds weren't so far out and spread you know, apart from each other, they wouldn't be able to find each other for breeding. So we really concentrated everything on San Juan Island. Now back in, I don't remember exactly what year it was, might've been 2012, um, we did have a pair go to Lopez and because I had put nest boxes up over there and they did actually make a nest. They weren't successful in breeding. I, that's a whole nother story I won't go into, but um, so it's showing that they will kind of reoccupy these sites, but I'm sorry, Orcas, they probably won't be coming here. Um, I will mention one other thing and, and that is I do get reports, maybe one a year of somebody sighting a bluebird on Orcas Island. And this is a real bluebird sighting. Um, and it most likely is a mountain bluebird uh, mountain bluebirds do move through this region um, to breed. They don't breed in the islands, but they move through um, to breed up in British Columbia. So, and for whatever reason, they, they do turn up more on orcas. Um, we get them on San Juan too, but um, biggest giveaway is if you see a bluebird that has leg bands on it, that's from our project and that's a Western bluebird, okay? Go ahead. So I'm curious if bluebirds aren't going to be habitat, uh, hab coming to orcas, why are we doing restoration habitat up on Turtle Duck? Well, this isn't just for bluebirds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Remember all the 120 other plant, plants and animals that call oak habitat, the 800 species of insects, all the lichens, mosses, microorganisms. This is about restoring a habitat function for an entire ecosystem, not one species. Um, bluebirds, of course, are just one link in that huge web. Okay. 
And could you describe the um, process of a private landowner to contact uh, you or get involved in the Gary Oak restoration project? Um, yeah, I mean, we have, um, I mean, we can provide all kinds of resources for private landowners if you want to do um, work on your own property. But if you are interested in joining any of our work we're doing on, on any of our preserves, we have a whole volunteer program for that. So best thing to do is um, check out our website, which is sjpt.org, and it, they'll have um, all kinds of events and opportunities. If you're more interested in doing